you have your Bibles this evening, I'm going to look at four, five different passages of Scripture, all very short. The first one, I'm going to give you a little heads up so you can get there in time, will be in Job chapter 35. But tonight is a night where we reflect upon this idea of living in the in-between. In New Testament theology, they call this the already and the not yet. In physics, you might have called it Schrodinger's cat, but that's a different message for a different day. It's this idea of being in between, in between Friday and all the bad things that happened on Good Friday and the resurrection on Sunday. The in-between is where we find ourselves most of the time. And I don't like living in between. We all probably enjoy beginnings. The idea of starting something is a lot of fun. And the idea of finishing is a lot of fun. I love this sense of completion that happens when you finish. But the in-between is what's hard. The middle is where we are tried and where we are tested. Israel left Egypt, for example, in power, but they muddled through the middle. So often our Christian lives begin amazing and they end in glory, but here in the middle it's far more complex and difficult. And this is certainly clear on this silent or holy Saturday. Between the cross and the empty tomb, there is silence. During this time, darkness seemed to overshadow the land. The apostles scatter, and the faithful women are waiting for the Sabbath to be over so that they might go anoint Jesus' body. So what we have is the silence. But silence with Jesus, silence with God, is never wasted. And tonight I want to share briefly about those times when it seems that all is silent. Those times when discouragement and despair want to kick in. Those times when perhaps nothing seems to be going right or even well. And in those moments, we begin to wonder, God, did you indeed forsake me? Is this the time that you abandoned me? Is this the time where I must go alone? And these next few verses that we'll see tonight speak to people who find themselves in a season that is dark, hurting, and hopeless. This can apply to us personally. Maybe you find this to be the case for you as a family or maybe in your career. Certainly as a nation, this in-between can feel appropriate. And what we'll see tonight is that God is not silent even in those darkest of times. And here in the waiting, here in the dark, here in the in-between, the Lord ministers to us in a very special and different way. So tonight I want to share with you five scriptures for the dark times. And the first one is found in the tucked away in the middle of this book called Job. Job is 50 chapters of just hard. The first chapter is pretty pretty exciting, and the last chapter is exciting, and everything in the middle is just hard. And tucked away here in the middle, in Job 35.10, we see a friend of Job's named Elihu, and he says, But none says, Where is God my maker? who gives songs in the night. It was this passage of scripture that got me down the rabbit trail that led me to Psalm chapter 42, verse 8, where the psalmist cries out, the Lord will send his faithful love by day and his song will be with me in the night, a prayer to the God of my life. Okay, two different instances, songs in the night. Psalm 77, 6. The, perhaps the same writer writes, At night I remember my music, I meditate in my heart, and my spirit ponders. And I began to wonder, are there other themes about this in the New Testament? And I come to Mark chapter 15, verses 33 and 34. And it parallels what we read last night from Matthew chapter 27, where in Mark 15 it says, When it was noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon, three hours of supernatural darkness. 
We have, you have to understand that, that this is not just an eclipse. This is not just some random storm clouds blocking the way, but this is a supernatural darkness. And at three, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, leme sabachthani, which we translate, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And that took me to one more verse. Acts chapter 16, verse 25. The Apostle Paul and his colleague Silas find themselves in prison again. And it says, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. As we look at these verses, we see this theme of how the Lord speaks even in the darkness. Even in the in-between, even when it seems like all is silent and all is lost, that the Lord ministers differently, but he ministers to us in these nighttime hours. For Job, in chapter Job chapter 35, we see Job in the middle of his trial. If you're not familiar with this story, in chapters, the early chapters, he loses everything. He loses literally everything except for his wife. Everything that he held dear is now gone. And then his friends show up to offer, we, we say encouragement, but really they're offering correction. They're trying to restore Job, so they think. And it's his friend, Elihu, who uttered these words to Job, Where is God, my maker, who gives me songs in the night? See, Elihu believes that if Job had been a good and righteous man, then God would have responded by now. If Job hadn't have sinned, which he hadn't have, surely this would not have come to pass. If you had just been a better person, if you had just prayed a little longer, if you had just worshipped a little harder, if you had just worked a little bit more, then Job, none of these things would have happened. You must have some hidden sin in your life. So repent now, and then it will all be okay, seems to be the messages of his friends. Elihu, like us, cannot imagine a good, righteous person suffering. His theology, Elihu's theology, did not have room for a righteous sufferer and could never have considered the supreme example of Jesus Christ himself. And so for the rest of the chapter, and really for the whole book, Elihu and his friends condemn Job in the midst of his pain. And the wisdom of Elihu is simply this. You must have sinned, otherwise this wouldn't have happened to you. Have you ever been in a place in life where it's just hard? And maybe it's your own conscience. Maybe it's your well-intended friends that are usually from church. They say, well, you must have done something wrong, otherwise this wouldn't have happened to you. But my friends, that's not gospel, that's karma. That hits really hard for Saturday night. That's not gospel. That's karma. And Elihu, chapter after chapter, verse after verse, says, Job, if you'll merely confess whatever sin you are hiding, then your trouble will stop. And Elihu thinks he's being helpful when we know that he surely is not. But even amidst all of his wrong advice, even in the middle of all of his bad theology, Elihu introduces this idea of songs in the night. And what does he mean by this? And why in the world are we talking about Job on the Saturday night of Easter weekend? For ourselves, we find ourselves that the cross was finished and the tomb is awaiting. But here in the middle, what is God doing? One of my favorite preachers of all time, his name was Charles Spurgeon in the 1800s. He writes it like this. He says, any man can sing in the daylight. And when the cup is full, man draws inspiration from it. When wealth rolls in abundance around him, any man can sing praise to a God who gives a plenteous harvest. It is easy to sing when we can read the notes by daylight, but he is the skillful singer who can sing when there's not a ray of light by which to read. Who sings from his heart and not from a book that he can see because he has no means of reading, save from that inward book 
of his own living spirit, whence notes of gratitude pour forth in songs of praise. No man can make a song in the night himself. He may attempt it, but he will find how difficult it is. For it is not natural to sing in trouble, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. For that, he says, is a daylight song. Songs in the night only come from God. They're not in the power of man. What Spurgeon is saying is this, that in those dark, hard moments, when it seems that we are alone and abandoned, there is a ministry of the Spirit that takes us by surprise. It is the ministry of a song, of words of praise that come from the deepest places, as if stored there for times like these. A couple examples come to my mind. As I'm preaching, I can't help but think of my grandma Raymond. She was widowed pretty young. Always had that old kind of spirit. Never learned how to drive. Never had a driver's license. Grandma Raymond's role in the family was simply this. She prayed for us. That's it. And in the hardest moments of her life, in the darkest moments of her life, she was that type of grandma that you could hear sometimes singing, sometimes praying, sometimes speaking in tongues underneath her breath. And you wonder, what is she saying? You would look at her in the house that she was in. You'd look at our bank account. You'd look at everything that had happened to her and think, this woman has no reason to sing. And yet she had learned how to sing even in the darkest days of life. A few years ago, I was sitting at the bedside of someone who I was sure was dying. And I, I've been around this before, and you, you know the look, and you know the scene, and you know when someone has those last few moments. And so I do the spiritual thing. The, the family was in the hospital room, and I called the family together, and I said, let's pray for her. And in, in those moments, I'm not praying for healing. I'm praying for her to go see Jesus. And so let's, let's, just, let's just pray. And let's just give thanks to the Lord. So I had a husband, and I was here, and the family members were around the hospital bed in the hospital room in Rolla. And I began to pray, Lord, I'm just so thankful for this dear sister's faithfulness and for your love that you've shown to her all these many years. And to be honest, I'm praying, but I'm just kind of talking, talking about how good God is how good God has been to this woman who I am sure is getting ready to die. And I open my eyes and I look, and here is this woman who had not moved in who knows how long. And her hands come up like this. And in that moment, she did what Job's friend is talking about, what Spurgeon is talking about here in a moment with David and what Paul and Silas did, that in that moment in darkness when death is out the door, she lifted her hands up and began to praise Jesus. How does that happen? That only happens by the ministry of the Spirit who gives us songs in the night. It's easy for us to sing when we're on top of the mountain. I have been to the spot of Pike's Peak that inspired the song America the Beautiful. And it's easy to sing in that altitude as long as you can catch your breath. But when you're at the bottom and you feel like you're drowning, and then you begin to sing, that, my friends, is the ministry of God who gives us songs in the night. The psalmist learned how to sing in the night himself. David knew what it was like to have dark nights. If you read his biography, King David endured family struggles, threats, rebellions, and everything else you possibly can imagine. David had moments of brilliance where he saw the visible glory of God. And then he had times that were so dark that he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And yet, even in those darkest of times, the Lord has this ability of stirring up a praise from within. Perhaps in those moments, David sang songs of his youth that he had learned during easier times. Sometimes the songs he sang would be spontaneously led by the Spirit of God. 
And from the depths of his inner being, God stirred up songs within David that gave voice to praise when all around us is cursing. And it's the hard times that betray our inner life. It's the in-between, it's the waiting that has a way of exposing what truly is happening inside of us. And I'm thankful that a ministry of the Holy Spirit is to sing in us when all songs have stopped. A ministry of the Spirit is to praise when all the blessings have seemed to disappear. And no one knew this better than Jesus. See, Jesus knew what to sing at the darkest moment of human history. As Mark 15 and Matthew 27 tell, as Jesus is upon the cross, he begins to quote phrases from Psalm chapter 22. He repeatedly echoes the words of this ancient psalm that foreshadowed his suffering. And in that moment, Psalm 22 becomes the liturgy of the cross. And as darkness descended upon earth during those terrible hours of Jesus' suffering, Jesus had a song in the night. A cry that declared that the feelings of abandonment were real, but also that he hoped that the Lord would not abandon him. And so, yes, dear saints of God, there will be times of darkness. I wish I could tell you that once you give your life to Jesus, it's all easy from here, but that, my friends, would be a lie. Even Jesus himself said, in this world, you will have trouble. But fear not, for I have overcome the world. Great victories often follow terrible darkness. Silent Saturday reminds us that God does not stay silent forever. And just as God heard the cry of Israel and their slavery, just as God heard the cry of David and his distress, just as God heard the cry of Jesus on the cross, so God will not abandon or forsake us either. As the song says, Friday's good because Sunday's coming. So tonight, if you find yourself in a place of discouragement, pain, or frustration, Fear not, for the Lord does hear our cries, and he does give us songs to sing when all the other singers have gone to sleep. And this is powerfully evident in one more example in the life of Paul and Silas. In Acts chapter 16, verse 25, we see that Paul and Silas knew how to sing in the depths of a prison cell. It says, About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. There is nothing darker than an ancient prison cell at midnight. There are no security lights. There is no moonlight to get in. There is just utter darkness. Paul and Silas were imprisoned here in Philippi for casting out the demonic darkness of a young woman. The authorities and the rulers, not wanting their darkness exposed, throw Paul and Silas into a dark prison. And they believed that a little bit of time in prison would do them some good. Perhaps it would break them, reform them, and correct them into their image, they believed. But what they could not distinguish was the light of Jesus within them. And thus we see that at midnight, Paul and Silas can be heard singing and praying to God. We don't know what they were singing. So they were singing some hymns. Hymns tell stories. Hymns tell doctrine. And so they began to sing the songs that were coming to them. Songs that they had learned at easier times. Perhaps songs that they had heard in church recently. But they began to sing. If you were in that spot tonight, what songs would come from you? I really doubt it'll be the songs of your youth, perhaps rock and roll or pop or whatever you listen to. I would imagine that when we find ourselves in those deepest, darkest moments, that we would begin to sing songs that have depth and meaning 
and praise. But more than likely, what you and I would be doing would be complaining. And while many of us in that situation would be complaining, Paul and Silas were praising. Because they knew of God's love and of his power. They don't know what was fixing to happen. They don't know that in just a few moments that a divine earthquake would shake the prisons and would set them free. They just knew that that was a great opportunity to sing praises to God. And even when all seemed hopeless, they were able to sing. And when they began to sing, they sang because even in the darkness, they knew that God was good. Even in the in-between, even in the not knowing, God was still on the throne. I remember some of my first ministry was in nursing homes in Fair, Missouri. Every Saturday, sorry, sorry Sunday afternoon, about 2 o'clock, hop in my little car. I would go play an attitude and piano. Often I would preach to a bunch of people who didn't even know I was in the room. But something I discovered was this. That even the person with the furthest stages of dementia, when you began to sing songs of their past, they could remember every line. We would sing songs like, There is coming a day when no heartache shall come, no more clouds in the sky, no more tears to dim the eye. All is peace forevermore on that happy golden shore. What a day! Glorious day that will be. Of all the people who shouldn't be able to sing that song, it was those people. Left, forgotten in a nursing home, very few visitors, losing the ability of their faculties and their body. But when we began to sing, on a hill, far away, that's all it would take. And then you would hear these old voices begin to pick up the song. Stood an old rugged cross. What were they doing? Where did those songs come from? Are they not ministries of the God who gives us songs in the night? Paul and Silas were praising God at midnight. And they knew that even here in the in-between, that God was trustworthy and he was good, and whatever happened here on earth, nothing was going to happen that was more than just a temporary setback. So why not sing in the night? And for you and I as Christians, even though we know that Sunday is coming, the songs of Saturday often become the most memorable. Let me close with one more story. A guy by the name of Horatio Spafford knew something about life's unexpected challenges. He was a successful attorney and real estate investor who lost a fortune in the great Chicago fire of 1871. Around the same time, his beloved four-year-old son died of scarlet fever. Thinking a vacation would do his family some good, he sent his wife and four daughters on a ship to England planning to join them after he finished some pressing business at home. However, while crossing the Atlantic Ocean, the ship was involved in a terrible collision and it sunk. More than 200 people lost their lives, including all four of Horatio Spafford's precious daughters. His wife, Anna, survived the tragedy, and upon arriving in England, she sent a telegram to her husband that began, Saved Alone. What shall I do? Horatio immediately set sail for England. And at one point during his voyage, the captain of the ship, aware of the tragedy that had struck the Spafford family, summoned Horatio to tell him that where they were now passing over the spot 
was the spot where the shipwreck had occurred. And as Horatio thought about his daughters, words of comfort and hope filled his heart and his mind. He wrote them down, and they have become what we would consider a well-beloved hymn. And the words that he wrote was this. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Horatio Spafford knew what it was like to sing a song to the Lord that was born from tragedy and pain. Some of us here tonight or in similar seasons. Maybe the loss of parents, strained relationships, difficult finances, and physical pain are realities for many of us who are here tonight. And although we know that breakthrough is coming, it too often feels like Saturday lasts forever. So what do we do here in the in-between? First thing, we surround ourselves with better friends than Job. You need to have people in your life who will remind you that God is still good even when we're sitting on a heap full of ashes. And we need friends who will remind us that Sunday is coming. Number two, we need to ask God to give us, to give us songs to sing in this season. David prayed and meditated in the times that were dark and heavy. Saturdays are not a waste of time, but a time to reflect on God and his goodness, even when the goodness feels far away. And like Jesus, we need to return to past songs that have depth, meaning, and are full of God's word. Jesus knew Psalm 22, and during his time on the cross, this is what Jesus quoted and fulfilled. When we're in the dark seasons of our life, we need to return to the roots. We need to sing the old hymns. We need to read the familiar psalms. And we need to return to the ancient altars and remember what God has done. And we need to be a little bit like Paul and Silas. That when it seems like life is too dark and heavy, we need to sing and pray louder in the dark because we never know who is listening. And so tonight, we will close with prayer. And in just a moment, we will leave the room, and I ask that all who leave will leave in silence so that the next words spoken, especially in this room, will be the shouts of joy tomorrow on Resurrection Sunday. But before we get there, I want to pray for those of us who find ourselves in between. Maybe you're in between the miracle. You're in between the reunion. You're in between the provision. You're in between that release of vision and calling. You're in between the pain of Friday and the joy of Sunday. And so tonight, I want to pray for those of us who are waiting. Would you stand with me this evening? want to lead us in a prayer tonight, and then we will go about our ways. Cannot wait to celebrate tomorrow. Sunday is just a few hours away. But tonight, as we prepare to leave in silence, would you bow your heads and your hearts with me this evening? So Lord, tonight, I pray for those of us who are waiting. We're waiting for a miracle. We're waiting for your divine intervention. We are waiting. And so, God of all comfort, as the Apostle Paul called you, I ask that you comfort us in our mourning, in our waiting, in the darkness of Saturday. And Lord, would you help us to not waste this time, but to take the opportunity to sing the songs that can only be sung at night. Help us be attentive and receptive to what you are teaching revealing and doing in those silent times. For even the Saturday between your death and your resurrection 
is called holy. For wherever you are is holy. So Lord, grant us rest tonight and give us joy in the morning, we pray in Jesus' name.